everybody. Here we go again. <laughs> Hi, my vitamin D people. So today we will be talking to Christina Kinning. Uh, I know most of you that are in the Facebook protocol groups know her. Uh, Christina is a German patient. Uh, she is the founder of the German protocol group. And more recently, she has founded a nonprofit organization to help uh, fund research into the Coimbra protocol. So she has done tons of things. I see her, let me invite her before she disappears. Let me see. Christina, I invited her. Hopefully this time will be better than last time. That was easy. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, Christina. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I'll just turn up the volume a little and then everything's fine. Oh. Okay, yeah, and uh, if anybody's having problems hearing us, just let us know, okay, guys? Christina, thank you so much for doing this and it's great to have you here. Yes, thank you for having me and inviting me. I'm so excited to talk yes, about it. Yes, you have tons to talk about it. So. What do you think if we start from the beginning, like from your diagnosis, your experience with MS? Because it's such a critical time for most patients. So like how, what is your experience and how you found and how you decided on the protocol as an option for you? Okay, so that's quite a long story. I'll try to cut it quite Just short. Just go for it, we have time. <laughs> well, looking back on my multiple sclerosis career, um, I had my first uh, flare-ups in uh, 2001, the first diagnosed ones. Um, as for most people know, often in multiple sclerosis, when you look back, you think, well, 1998, 1999, there were things which might have been the first times, but first diagnosed 2001. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was quite lucky because uh, my illness wasn't that bad and my neurologist was uh, kind of a wait and see guy so we didn't do any medications in the beginning uh, I had a uh, flare up on the op optic nerve and like three or four months later I had a very bad flare up with uh, hemiparesis of the left side of my body and mm -hmm. my whole face was hanging down colleagues thought I had a stroke <laughs> So this was a bad one, and uh, it left some signs, uh, but I didn't get any treatment because uh, I was quite well informed about the, well, let's say, not so optimistic outcome of yes. my diagnosis, pharmacological. Uh, at, at that time, 2001, they only had the interferons, right? Yeah, know? that's right. Back yeah. then, there weren't a lot of options. And um, so I just lived my life, and it was quite okay uh, till the year of 2008. Um, I didn't have any treatment till then, just some naturopath treatments like homeopathy and some uh, supplements. Did you have more relapses or no, just the first one? Well, I didn't really realize any. Right. Uh, I, sometimes I had a tingling here and there. Sometimes my sight on the one eye wasn't that good, but it always resolved on its own. I didn't have, I didn't even have corticoids, um, so no corticosteroids. Right. And, uh, but it was in the year 2008, I think, when I realized that I had kind of a cognitive decline. Mm. I couldn't concentrate very well. I was working in uh, with a big international company in a um, big bureau with a lot of people, and I started to be very sensitive to noise, to to my surroundings, and I couldn't really concentrate. Um, I always felt very tired in the evening, and it was always like living from <laughs> uh, Monday to Friday, trying to drag myself through life, and on the weekends just relaxing, lying down, not having a life at all. And then uh, I think it was 2010 when I had the next uh, really flare that I realized I had a optic nerve uh, thing again. Mm -hmm. and since then, I've had like yearly flare ups, but not that bad. They were always just, I, I, I somehow convinced myself that it would resolve on its own. And it was. Uh, yeah, we, well, sometimes we try to ignore, right? Yeah. When we start feeling things, yes. Yeah. yeah, and I think maybe this was even quite good because I lived my life, I was psychological, okay. But in 2012, I started to go to a lot of doctors and I said, mm -hmm. well, many symptoms and somehow it doesn't up, or doesn't add up. Um, 
I've got uh, vertigo, I can't sleep very well, I've got pain in my back, I've got constant headache. Uh, um, sometimes I feel like I can't really concentrate. I'm not the same person that I was. And yeah. uh, nobody really did a diagnosis. I was, uh, most time when they didn't find something, they said, well, it must be psychological. Maybe you have a lot of stress, you, know, you have mm -hmm. a birth. Yeah, they always blame on the stress. It was the same with me, it was the stress, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is stress is an important factor in autoimmune yeah. disease, but um, I felt, I didn't feel really good with all those doctors telling me that it was just in my head. Well, right. it wasn't in my head, but in another way than they thought. Yeah. You knew there was something more. It could be stress, but there was something physical as yeah. well, right? Yeah. Definitely. And it, uh, it took me until 2015, and I had a very, very bad flare then, mm -hmm. uh, which left me half paralyzed uh, on my left side. I, I really couldn't move anything. Um, I couldn't control my bladder or my bowels. Um, I was blind on one eye and like 30% on the other eye. And uh, I was in, yeah, just in shock, horror and panic. And um, then I really pushed a neurologist to do an MRI. Mm -hmm. And back then it was quite devastating because uh, back then, I had already over 30 old um, scars in my head. Oh, my God. Uh, I had, at that time, in 2015, I had uh, five active lesions in my brain and three in my spinal cord. And um, I had uh, corticosteroids for m many days, and um, which left me in a psychological state that was very funny. I was not only depressed, but... Yeah, if I would have been able, I might have taken my life, but I wasn't able to do this because I was so ill. Thank God, we're all very lucky for it. <laughs> yes, I am too today. <laughs> but it was a really hard time, and I'm sharing this because a lot of people don't know that corticosteroids can put you in a really bad depression and a really deep state of depression, which might even bring you to end your life. And then I, I'm so I actually didn't know that, Christina. I, yeah. had, I had never heard of that. I never took corticosteroids, so I didn't know that. Yeah, lucky for you that you didn't take it. Uh, it's a very common uh, side effect, and m most neurologists don't tell you, and uh, people are so scared if they get into this dark place after corticosteroids. Yes. And, yeah. And, well, and that's so sad because the diseases are already so scary, and then you take this treatment, which puts you in a deeper depression. So yeah. it makes the disease even worse. And yeah, it, it, it just seems that it's like a place where you are when you go into the conventional treatment that it's very hard to get out of, like the yeah. depression, the anxiety. And one thing makes the other one worse. The treatment uh, makes the depression worse. The depression makes the disease, the disease worse. The symptoms make the depression worse. And it's just very hard to break through when you are in all that. Yes. Yeah, it's an absolute vicious circle. Yeah. And well, even back then when I was so ill, I refused any other treatment. I didn't have any, uh, well, they were only trying to push escalation therapy. Of course, at this time, uh, we were only talking Milenia, Tuzabri, or whatever the name is. And um, my neurologist hardly uh, advised that I go to a hospital and get hospitalized for a plasma pharesis. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to do all those things. I said, just leave me alone. I just want to go home and get well again. Right. And um, it was about, I think, well, this bed flare was in May 2015. And, um, you know, I was, I was really disabled. I was lying in bed. I couldn't take care of myself. I had to get help for my personal hygiene, let alone anything. I forgot um, most of my PIN numbers and everything. It was a really bad time. And um, thank God I've got a very loving husband who treated me very well and helped me. And um, I think it was in summer 2015. Um, I was always screening the internet and looking for things. I've tried a lot of stuff before um, in the years between 2012, 2015. I did a lot of mm -hmm. like, any kind of diet that there is. <laughs> I, uh, I did... Um, mushrooms, I did uh, any kind of supplement. So I tried really everything and anything that sounded uh, half, uh, half good and spent a lot of money. So when I stumbled upon the Coimbra protocol first in summer 2015, yeah. I thought, well, this sounds really too good to be true. Did you find it online? Yes. 
Um, I read the blog of an Australian uh, patient. I think her yeah. name is Roberta. And yeah. uh, it was, yeah, you know, she sounded reasonable. She sounded uh, well-informed. Uh, she sounded honest. And it somehow stuck in my head. But, I, you know, I, I just put it away and I said, well, this, this is just too good to be true. Yeah. But somehow, you know, <laughs> nights after I read her blog, I woke up in the middle of the night and it was like my subconscious was telling me to try to find out something more about vitamin D. And that's what I did. I got online, I did my research, and I found such a lot of uh, research on vitamin D. Yes. And I thought, well, maybe there's something with this. And I contacted Roberta and she said, yeah, this is a really good thing. I know that it's hard to believe, but I can- This is the real deal. <laughs> yes, it's the real deal. <laughs> And she gave me the email address of Dr. Cesar Roku Imbra. And she said, just contact him. He will help you. And I said, well, this is a professor at a university. Yes. He probably won't get back to me. Yeah, but luckily he did. <laughs> so within two days, I received an email. And he was so, well, you know him as a person. He's so, oh, I always have to not get too emotional when I talk about it because he's such a loving, kind person. Yes. I'm so grateful that he got back to me and he said, well, yes, it is a serious treatment. If you have a doctor that can follow you, I'll send you all the details and you can start on the protocol. You don't need me. You just need a doctor to um, supervise you. And so I contacted the doctor that I know, I, I'm, who's a friend of mine, mm -hmm. Dr. the first protocol doctor in Germany. And he said, well, sounds a bit too good to be true, but I'll look into it. And you are so desperate. And, and I know... Yeah. You probably will do it without me if I don't guide you, so let's do it. And he contacted Cesar Coimbra, and we started the protocol in March 2016. And, so, yeah, uh, four years then. Excuse me? Four years then that you have been on the protocol. Yeah, quite exactly, four, four years by now. And, um, well, back then, you know, um, I had another flare-up in January 2016. 16, and this was the one that really, um, yeah, my, my cognition, my cognitive function was almost gone. I was not able to form a coherent sentence, let alone speak another language. Okay. I wasn't even, even able to speak my mother tongue by the time back then. And uh, yeah, I couldn't put down my address. I couldn't write. I couldn't uh, move half of my body. So I was really, really in bad shape by the time we started the protocol. My walking distance was like, I think, a hundred meters and I used some wow. walking sticks. I had to uh, get some aid. So you were really in bad shape. Yes, it was a really dark time. <laughs> and um, yeah, but I had hope because um, yeah, it was so bad, you know, I would have tried everything and anything by the time back then. And, and what thing is like when you talk to Dr. Coimbra, he does make you believe, right? He does tell you with no doubt, you will get better, this will work for you. You have no more problems with this disease. I mean, he really makes you believe. So, yes, he gives a lot of hope. Yeah, in his appointments, yeah. He directly reaches your heart. I don't know how he does it, but it's, well, he's kind of a saint for me. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, in the beginning, it was only, I think, three or four weeks until I noticed the first effects. I had more energy. I got up in a better mood. It was like, I always call, uh, um, I, I always tell people it's like somebody was switching on a light bulb in my head again. So it also fast for you. Three to four weeks is very fast. Yes, it was the first effect. Of course, it didn't last. And of yeah. course, it wasn't the full, full effect. But it was the first thing that I noticed. I got up in a better mood in the morning. Right. It was like, you know, I was in such a dark place back then. And with just a few weeks of vitamin D, I started to feel enlightened internally and it was you know we were back then we were really thinking is it kind of a jesus factor that dr coimbra has is it kind of a healing power magic that he does even via email and telephone we didn't we weren't really sure <laughs> i think he really makes you believe and so once you believe things immediately start getting better like no matter yeah. what you see a light at the end so yeah yeah you that was that, but like so you start getting better but then you got worse again because it's important because we see some patients that that happens a lot and they get discouraged right and yeah. sometimes they just give up on the treatment it's very normal to get better have a peak and then go down again for a while did, did yeah. it happen to you then absolutely happened to me i've seen it in a lot of hundreds of patients by now 
And um, it was, you know, this was the first beginning of feeling more energy. Then we had the first dose adjustment. I think it was after six weeks or something. It was quite quick. And um, after that, I started to decline very badly again. Mm -hmm. um, like all my old symptoms were flaring up. And I was really, uh, yeah, I would was uh, quite afraid back then. And luckily, I had those Facebook groups in the US and um, yeah, in, in the Brazilian uh, group. I don't know if we were in contact back then. Yeah, no, I don't think that. I think uh, we got in contact maybe in the beginning of 2017. Yeah, yeah, but I've read your book. This was the oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've read your book and, and yeah, your book was one of the last factors that really made me start the treatment because there were so many patients in there telling all the same experience, all mm -hmm. the same story that I thought there has to be something behind it. So right. thank you for writing this book. <laughs> oh, thank you for translating it. If people that don't know, Christina is the translator for the German book. So yes, thank you. <laughs> I simply had to do it because it gave me so much hope and it gave me the last push and notch to start the treatment and I wanted this for other people too. So good so, to hear that, yes. Yeah, yeah, but we were talking about the ups and downs of the treatment during yes. the first month. So it was really kind of a roller coaster during the first month. And I think what I've seen by now it's quite typical that you're on a roller coaster ride for the first month of treatment. And um Do you think it, it can last more than a month? That you can be in a roller coaster for a few months? Do you think some yeah. patients that happen to some patients? Definitely happened to me. Um it's been like, you know, after each time when we somehow adjusted the vitamin D dose again, I got on the roller coaster again. And um even uh in the following years, as soon as I didn't treat me very good. As soon as I didn't watch my energy, uh, I got on the roller coaster again. So you really have to be careful during the last. When you say roller coaster, Christina, just so because there are a lot of people watching us and that are still going to see the video later and they are not really familiar with the protocol. What do you mean? Like, what do, did you feel? What do patients feel? Like, I know you work with other patients, so you yeah. can talk about that. Yes. Yes. So um, what I felt was. Um, Sometimes in the morning I got up and a symptom was gone, absolutely gone. And I was, uh, of course, really excited. And I thought, well, this is kind of a wonder. But then after a few hours, it returned. And um, maybe it was uh, fully fledged on in the evening again. And um, sometimes there were days when I woke up and the symptom was even worse than it was the day before. So during the first month, it was really, yeah, roller coasters. Uh, Very the, intense, the peaks. Up and down, up and down. And, but after a while, I realized, okay, I'm not going down this deep and I'm going higher up. So it was kind of a roller coaster that started to descend. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. So, and I think that's what I've seen in patients that we treat here in Germany. It's quite typical to have this during the first month. It's never as bad as you had it during a flare up. It's yeah. important to know so people don't get scared. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. But it's um, like, old things showing a little what they were. And, right. um, and doctor... one explanation is that the vitamin D might be acting in your immune system, right? And so the immune system is a little unstable all this time. And so the symptoms can come back, yes. right? It's, or there's other explanations. So what I've learned by now, you know, I've done a uh, two times training with Dr. Krumer himself by, by now. And, yeah. um, uh, I'm working with three doctors here in Germany, yes. so I've gotten a lot of knowledge in the treatment of patients. And um, one doctor explained to me it, that it's a twofold thing that is happening here. Um, the first thing is when we push these high vitamin D doses, we are trying to overcome. I think we'll get deeper into it uh, later, but um, just for now, we're trying to overcome a resistance against vitamin D. And um, we're pushing a lot of vitamin D in the beginning, and um, your whole hormonal system has to work around this new uh, player because it's a, a vitamin D is like the star hormone in your body. It's yes. a hormone, it's not a vitamin. It's exactly. has a small thing. <laughs> yes. And this star hormone has been missing. And um, as soon as it gets back into the team, all the other players have to sort new around it. And that's why um, you'll see a lot of changes in your hormonal balance. And this can put you on a roller coaster. And then the other thing, what will happen later in treatment, not in the beginning, but 
for younger patients, maybe after a few months, for older patients, it might take a year or two. But as soon as we've stopped the autoimmune disease, your body will start healing some of the younger symptoms, some mm -hmm. of the younger uh, lesions. Yes. Uh, this is, of course, it's not like, um, uh, we're not a mechanical thing. It's not like um, stopping and then healing, but it's a gradual evolvement. And it also and depends on the patients. Some patients don't feel worse at all. I didn't feel worse at all when I started. It took me seven months, but I started getting better and went from there. So it really depends on the patient. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And um, I think on the um, individual resistance against vitamin D, um, if you need really high doses to overcome your resistance, it might yeah. get a bit... Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unstable in the beginning, but it will, it will level out, yeah, after a few Absolutely. months. And, um, you know, I've, I was talking about a twofold thing that is going on. One is the hormonal thing. And the other thing is that your body starts healing some of the old lesions. And um, a doctor who's specialist in pain treatment is Dr. Beatrice Schweiger. She's mm -hmm. my leading German protocol doctor. She's uh, the one who will train other doctors in the future. And she specialized in uh, pain treatment and nerve damages. And yes. she said, as soon as a nerve is starting to heal, you get kind of like a rewiring process in your brain and um, in your spinal cord. And this may cause some of the old lesions to uh, kind of flare up and some of the old symptoms to show. So, well, in, to sum it up, you can be happy if you don't feel good during the first month because- it, Yes, um, something's just, happening. Yeah, something's happening. If it's just a little up and down, you can be quite sure that the protocol is starting to work. Right. You yeah. know, Christina, that is so interesting to know that Dr. Beatrix uh, has said that too, when you are healing, you can have some symptoms because that's something I have asked my neurologist here in the U.S. quite often because I do have a big lesion on my spinal cord and many times I felt symptoms coming back and the lesion was getting smaller. And I told her, I asked her, if the lesion is healing, could I feel symptoms because of that? And she said, no, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so you know, I'm so glad to hear that because I had not heard Dr. Coimbra talking about that. And uh, you are much more in contact with the doctor. So I know you have all the knowledge pretty much they have. So it's great to hear that because I asked it many times my neurologist here. She said, no. <laughs> yeah. So that's good to know. With neurologists, it's quite a funny thing because... Yeah. Um, when I started treatment, my neurologist was absolutely convinced that I'm trying to kill myself. He even oh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, thought about admitting me to the psychiatric ward because he said, I don't have any uh, insight into how ill I am and I'm about to kill myself. And I oh, said, my oh. God, Christina. Yeah, with this super dangerous vitamin D, right? Yeah. yeah. And I just told him, you know, I'll be back in a year and then you can look on my MRI and we'll see what happened until then. And <laughs> what we saw, um, I had an MRI in November 2016 for the first time. So it was eight months after I started treatment. Yeah. And um, even back then, you know, I was a really, really uh, critical case. When I started treatment, my lesions had even more build up. So I had like nine active lesions in my brain and five in my spinal cord. And some of the spinal cord lesions were um, going over three um, uh, vertebras. And uh, <laughs> That's a lot, Christina. Yeah. That's a lot. It's amazing it's, how well you are today. I yeah. mean, I saw your pictures earlier on Instagram and Facebook, lifting weights and everything. It's like, it's amazing, right? Almost 20 years of MS and you yeah. look this great. You're doing this great. I mean, what a blessing. Yeah, we have to be uh, honest here. I'm not absolutely healed and I'm not really sure if I ever will be because... Yeah. Uh, I'm turning 47 years now in, in summer this year. Mm -hmm. We see a tendency, the older the patient and the older the um, uh, illness, yes. the longer it might take until you see something and the less you might experience symptoms getting better. So healing is something that will be easy in young patients uh, mm -hmm. who don't have as many um, lesions and your body can still regenerate, um, especially when you are um, younger than 30 years. Uh, the older you get, the harder it gets for your body, but it's not impossible. So I was compared to the multitude of patients, I was quite ill and um, yeah, 
you could say I was already quite old at 42 when I started treatment or 43. And, um, but you can see a lot of things getting better, but you have to give it time. I think yeah. this is the most important message to all patients starting the protocol. Yes. Yes. Please be patient and don't overdo anything. Um, don't expect miracles. Yes. But be open for healing to happen if you give it the right conditions, like watch your stress levels, watch your um, diet, uh, follow your protocol doctor, <laughs> take your supplements, yes. and give it, be patient. This is the most important message, it I is. think. It is, because it's very hard, mainly when you do have some symptoms, you get worse, you get better. Uh, patients get very discouraged, or when it takes too long to start feeling the healing, or when uh, patients expect too much. But you said, yeah. don't expect miracles. That's really important. Because yeah. as you said, you are not healed completely. I'm not sure I'm healed completely either after 12 years. So you just need to be realistic. Like this are progressive disease. So as long as you are not getting worse and you are very slowly getting better, or at least staying the same, that is already progress for us, right? So that's yeah. really important. Christine, yeah. but since you mentioned the stress levels and all that, do you want to go a little bit into it? Because it's really, I think besides vitamin D, I think it's the most important factor, right, in the protocol. And a lot of people don't understand why. They think it's something very abstract. That might be, we see a lot in the groups, people say, it's just an excuse the doctors find. When it's not working, they say, it's your fault, it's stress. But it's not, right? It's a physical process. So do you want to go a little bit into it? And... Yes, I'd love to. Yes. You know, it's funny because um, stress is kind of my, <laughs> uh, my habit because um, I've been working as a psychotherapist for many years with people on uh, high stress levels, so mainly managers and people with the burnout. And it's so funny because um, I have this... Uh, I so have this you, you are a psychologist, right? Yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a trained naturopath in psychology, and um, I've been working with people in stress management since 2005, so I've got quite a lot of experience. Um, I've had a burnout once, again, once in my life, uh, personally, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny because <laughs> Dr. Coimbra told me he, he uh, sees kind of a typical MS personality. He says most of his MS patients, and I can say that I, I am such a person, they are always uh, kind of pushy. They are trying to get everything and right now. And uh, yeah, they are uh, doing a lot. They're overdoing a lot of things. They want to be perfect. And um, this is exactly how I live my life. And um, MS was quite humility. Yeah, it, it, yeah um, I was becoming humble. I needed to become humble with the disease because um, I couldn't do as much as I did when I was younger. So. Um, Stress. What is happening in stress? Um, a lot of time when people talk about stress, they point outwards and say, there's the stress. It's my part, it's my work, it's the whole surrounding, the uh, corona pandemic situation and everything. But this is, uh, uh, in a medical way, this is not the right way to explain it. Stress happens inside your brain. Um, we've got quite an old part in our brain, yeah, which has helped us survive. Mm -hmm. And this is the part where we are... Um, scanning our environment and, and whenever our brain says, oh, this might be dangerous, um, I might get killed, I might get harmed, um, then your body will uh, start um, uh, pushing uh, certain hormones in your body. It's stress hormones and those stress hormones can help you to be alert to fight or flight. These are the two options that we had back then. Um, today, of course, we neither fight nor <laughs> do we flee, yes. but um, we uh, stay put in the situation, and this might uh, always put us on a very, very high level of stress hormones in our body. Yes. And those stress hormones, when you have them in your body, um, they do cause inflammation. They do cause your immune system to go absolutely havoc. So um, stress is not a esoteric kind of thing. Yes. Um, Stress is something that is happening inside your brain, signaling your body uh, to put out stress hormones, and this will make your autoimmune disease worse. And um, whenever do you, we... Do you want to talk a little bit about 
the folate process that envelops the gene or you don't want to go there because I know it's very complex and technical or yeah yeah we can we can somehow talk a little bit about it um because I think that really uh shows to people like it's like a picture that shows what exactly stress does in your autoimmune disease you know if you want I can go over very fast but if not I'll let you because then you know a lot more about technical things than I do <laughs> but uh <laughs> I think it's important because people, is, when you talk about stress, stress causes inflammation and makes your autoimmune disease worse. It's still abstract to people. And I think that explanation that Dr. Goldenberg gives about how folate envelops the gene, the, the defective gene, I think that, that really, you know, makes sense. It makes people, oh, that's exactly what happens. I think it's really useful for people. Okay, I'll try to put it in a nutshell. <laughs> okay, nutshell, yes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Maybe we can get a step back to uh, um, explaining in short how the treatment works, because um, what we are doing here is we are overcoming a genetically induced vitamin D resistance. Mm -hmm. So we have um, small, faulty genes. Um, some of our genes are not working 100%. Mm -hmm. um, to just give you a medical explanation, it's um, called single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, which means like um, your gene uh, has some small uh, faults in his inscription. So your body is not fully uh, able to express this gene. And um, this is the reason why you are not able to transform vitamin D. Right. So when you, when you build vitamin D, when you get enough to swallow the supplement, your body still has to um, uh, make a change to get the activated vitamin D. Right. And then uh, it will also need a last step to enter the cell. And as soon as vitamin D is able to enter the cell, the cell can read it. Yeah, I always say it's kind of, um, they have kind of an explanation there. The cell knows what to do in mm -hmm. our gene. In Britain, what is my job? What do I do? Am I part of skin? Am I part of uh, hair or whatever do I have to do? So, and this is necessary. Uh, vitamin D is necessary for the cell to be able to read its genes, its DNA. Yes. And another thing that is important to switch on or off those DNA parts is um, stress hormone levels. So vitamin D is one very important factor to yes. uh, make the body able to read its and express its uh, DNA. Um, but stress is another very important factor because, as we just explained, stress uh, makes your body um, put out a lot of stress hormones. Yes. And stress hormones um, might end up in your body not being able to read the DNA. And um, Dr. Koimra has a very funny picture when he explains this to patients. He says, um, you know, for your body to be fully functional, um, your, all your... Uh, on the cellular level, all your parts have to work together and yeah. all your DNA has to work together. All your genes have to work together. They have to communicate well. And um, he always paints the picture of a choir singing together. And um, there are some genes in this choir who sing very bad. You know, their voice is somehow uh, out of tune. Yeah. And these are those genes that are kind of faulty, those with the single nucleotide polymorphism uh, stuff right. that, that don't really work. And um, then there are some others who can sing very well and they've right. got a very nice voice. And um, what vitamin D does is um, somehow silencing, silencing those genes that um, sing with an off voice <laughs> and enhancing those genes um, that are working well, that are singing well in the yes. choir. Yes. As soon as you are on a lot of stress, um, you will need much more vitamin D to silence the faulty genes mm -hmm. and tune up the good ones. Right. And you might even not be able to do it with vitamin D. If your body is in too much and too long of a fight and flight situation, in a stress situation with yes. a lot of um, stress hormones in your body, uh, your genes will not be regulated well. So this is really a medical thing. It's not a woo-woo esoteric yes. kind of thing. And it's definitely not an excuse that the doctors give you. So, And I think the really sad thing is that we, especially here in Germany, our culture is so deeply engraved with stress and traumatic experiences. And mm -hmm. kind of the 
normal, the normal functioning in Germany is stressful, paranoid, with a lot of, um, not anger, but um, people are afraid of a lot of things. They worry a lot of the time. And, but this, um, is, this is common, I think, to most of the planet, especially these days. I think yeah. every country is going through that now. Yes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been to Brazil two times now, and people are so much more laid back. They have their family. Um, they have much more of a social life. They touch each other a lot more. And here in Germany, I, I feel stressed whenever I come back to my home, <laughs> to, to, to Germany when I come Yeah, it's here. a level up. It's a level up in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. And this is the hardest thing to explain to patients here in Germany. Um, you know, in the Facebook group that we have, they keep discussing about every little vitamin, every, if it's five micrograms or 10 micrograms, if they should take this brand or that brand. And I'm always trying to tell them, people, relax. vitamins are important, but please relax. Yes. You're worrying about the right supplement will probably make you worse. So please stop. Just take the thing that your doctor gave you and give it time and watch your stress levels. Right. And most people uh, feel like, I've got some uh, answers like people saying, so you are now blaming me. I am to blame for my illness. And I say, no, 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 please don't get it wrong. The good thing is you can do something here. You can do something. You, uh, you can be the owner of your life. You can be the owner of your stress level and you can learn how to relax. And please put some time and energy into learning how to relax. This is the most important message, I think. Yes, it is. Sometimes it's, ha it's hard to get through, but I think more and more people are understanding that it is part of the treatment. That, yeah, as you said, if you are always on a fight or flight and your stress hormones are always up, there is not enough vitamin D that is going to be able to silence those genes and to make the disease inactive. I mean, it, might, it probably still will help, and the disease will be less aggressive than what it would be, but yeah. there will always be some kind of activity in there because of those high levels of stress hormones. So I think people are understanding this better now than they were a few years ago where it was still very abstract. I mean, we knew it was bad, but we didn't know exactly why it was so bad. So I think this is getting better now. So, yeah. Yes, that's Christina, and uh, let me ask you, you work with doctors, right? You give um, you give support to patients and all that. So what is the big obstacle you see patients on the protocol that are starting? Do you think it's the stress? Do you think it's the diet? Uh, do you think it's the lack of confidence because there's no randomized studies? Or what do you think is the biggest ob obstacle now for, for the protocol and patients on the protocol? I think it, um, it's different. Um... The, the biggest obstacle in the beginning is that people are too skeptical to believe right. uh, and to uh, even contact a doctor or even contact me. And But uh, because there are no double-blind studies, there are no uh, really good retrospective studies. We're trying to fix this now, but yes. uh, until now. And so... But uh, by the time they contact me or they contact a the doctor, they've always already overcome this first obstacle. And then when they start treatment, um, the most of them are afraid of the diet, which mm -hmm. is quite hard. It's very easy. Very easy. <laughs> it is not a diet approach, and you don't have to do a lot of things. The only thing that you have to watch out for is that you reduce calcium in your diet because vitamin D will um, massively enhance your body's um, possibility to take up calcium from your diet and so we just have to reduce it a little bit um, like only getting half of what a normal patient or a normal person would get so only reduce not eliminate it's yeah. not possible to eliminate and it wouldn't be healthy so this is really easy to do and we always tell people just follow three very easy rules um, Stay away from any kind of dairy because dairy is also um, highly inflammable. And it will raise inflammation in the body. And um, try to find a vegan alternative without any calcium added. Mm -hmm. In Germany, 
And um, the second thing is um, try to avoid anything, of course, avoid things that have added calcium, that is quite clear, but also avoid things that are really high in calcium, um, like um, bones from sardines or um, right. any kind of animal. And um, many nuts with, and things like that. Yeah, and, and, and watch out for the right uh, kind of nuts and, and seeds. Those yeah. are the most important things. If you do this, you're on uh, you you're probably okay with the diet you don't have to calculate a lot although Germans seem to like this <laughs> yeah. but there's no somebody calcium. saying that they don't understand the calcium part that is because we take such high dose of vitamin d that we absorb too much calcium so right. we have to be careful not to have uh, hypercalcemia right which is because calcium is very toxic so we need to make sure we keep our calcium levels into the normal range so yeah yeah right and so people are most afraid of the diet in the beginning, but um, this is one of the reasons why I do those um, um, first coachings for patients, because doctors realize um, patients are asking such a lot of practical questions, and sometimes the doctors say, Pooh, you know, you're asking me questions that I've never thought about, and they uh, started to contact me and said, how do you do it? You've been doing it for a while now. And, and then I said, well, just let me, uh, give me their phone number, I'll talk to them. And after a while, doctors started asking me to do kind of a first coaching before treatment starts because right. we see that um, uh, yeah, patients are a lot more confident after they've talked to another patient. Yes. Um, they are a lot more confident how they can implement the calcium reduced diet into their life because it is very easy. Um, and they are much more confident um, that they will be able to lessen their stress levels because um, in my opinion, this stress level thing is the most important and the biggest obstacle yes. for most patients, but they don't see it in the beginning. It's yeah. very funny yes. because whenever I address this in my first coachings, people say, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not stressed. I'm not stressed. And, you know, you can realize that sometimes they're like, go on, it make stress. I don't have that much time. Please, just give me. Exactly. Say, no, yes. no, I'm not stressed. I'm not stressed. And we I see think, that in the groups. It's like, first, like, no, no, I'm not stressed. And then we see them arguing with everybody, fighting with everybody in the group. It's like, hello. <laughs> yeah, you know, I get stressed when I talk to those people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> And um, yeah, but luckily it's, you know, it's quite easy for me because I'm a patient, I'm not a doctor. I think I can talk um, with a different attitude and I can tell people, yes, <laughs> I know that you're convinced to not have stress levels. I was the same. I was exactly in the, in the place where you are right now, but believe me, it will be important. And yeah. please somehow think about it, take it home, contemplate on your stress levels, yes. look into your life and, um, and, and I think with time, people can tell by themselves. Like, I could tell from the beginning, before I knew the stress, when I first got diagnosed, I realized when I got super nervous, and it was, when I got diagnosed, I, I didn't have uh, health insurance here in the U.S. Yes. And so every time the bills arrived, because all the tests I was doing for the diagnosis, my tingling got 100 times worse, and I started noticing that. And yeah. so in the beginning, I even thought maybe this is all psychological because the doctors were telling me it was a stress because I, I thought if it was neurological, it wouldn't change, right, with my emotional state. And, yeah. but, and so I noticed that from the beginning. So that's when Dr. Coimbra started talking about it made sense to me because I had had the experience before. So I think with time, if people start noticing, when they are more relaxed, they have less symptoms. When they're more stressed, they have more symptoms. They will realize, yeah, along their treatment, but it takes a little time until all makes sense to them. Yeah, you know, when you, when you address it, um, most people get it instantly because um, exactly like you described your experience, they all have had this experience. Yes. And one of the doctors I'm working with is um, Johannes Demuth in, in Seeshaupt at Munich. Um, he even does a psychological um, uh, analysis in the beginning, and he asks people, what has happened in your life? When you think back the first time when you notice your first MS symptoms, what was going on in your life back then? And usually, with 100% uh, certainty, they tell us, yes, I've had a lot of stress now that you ask for it. I've, um, I, I was uh, going through a divorce. Um, my loved one died. Mm -hmm. um, Big, big fight with somebody yeah. and uh, when you address it when you ask people they realize it yes and 
funny enough, um, even if you know it, you know, <laughs> I knew it better than anyone. I should have known it better than anyone. But even I was getting stressed during the last years um, of treatment because, you know, I was trying to get this Coimbra protocol rolling in Germany and there was a lot of um, obstacles to overcome. There were a lot of haters on Facebook. I can, and, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, there were times when I was getting bad again and I was asking my doctor what's going on and he was looking at my blood work and he said, well, your parathyroid hormone has risen again. Right. Um, your inflammation levels have risen again. Did you have a lot of stress lately? And I said, oh, yes, I did. I'm afraid I did. So we had to increase my vitamin D doses to lower my PDH again. Right. Yes. And to be stable again and yeah. as soon as I ended the stress as soon as I was able to relax um, we could decrease my vitamin D dose again yeah it's so, amazing it's amazing yeah. direct relationship yeah yes yeah Christina in like we have kind of 15 minutes left see how fast time goes you have so much to say but uh, one thing also that I want I talk to I want to talk to you about your organization now to fund uh, the research but before that, one thing that people always ask you on the page is about the side effects. Did you have any side effects from the Coimbra Protocol? And if you did, no, you didn't any at all? No bad side effects. When you talk about side effects, people always think about bad yeah, things. Bad. So I've never had um, any bad things happen to me. Um, I once had a slight uh, too high calcium level. Um, it was after we had to adjust my dose because I was so stressed. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the higher the vitamin D dose, the higher the calcium uptake and the higher the risk of getting hypercalcemia. Yes. But lucky enough, if you stick to the um, regular appointments with your doctor and um, you have your blood levels and your urine levels checked, you will notice um, very early if you are developing hypercalcemia. Yes. And this was the only time... I once um, had some really slight symptoms of hypercalcemia, but it was really so slight that even I didn't get it. And um, we then reduced and stopped for a week and uh, returned to a low dose and everything was fine. I was never harmed in any way. Yeah. I had a lot of good side effects. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the good side effects, it's a long list. Yeah. But I want to ask you, somebody asked about physical exercise, how, how much you do, like, for me, I try to do one hour every day. I, I'm not going to say I do seven days a week, but I try at least five days a week, one hour, either on the treadmill or on the bow flex or something like that, weightlifting. So I'm going to ask you too, but just so people know, the side effects are the hypercalcemia, which is very easy to catch if you do the, the tests that the doctors ask, right, regularly. Yeah. And then osteopenia, osteoporosis, so you didn't have any problems with osteopenia, so no. And you no. exercise, right? So like how much you exercise, what does it work for you, like as exercise goes? I didn't get this. I oh, like how, how much do you exercise every day? Somebody asked it here. Okay. What is your exercise routine? And maybe that's what is helping you not to develop osteopenia or osteoporosis, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, by now I do exercise quite regular, like mm -hmm three times at least, sometimes I do four or five times. But of course, I wasn't absolutely wasn't able to do this in the beginning. And this is an important message too. If you're too ill mm -hmm. to do it during the first month, uh, just worry because it will take a few years until your bones might deteriorate without sports. Um, so in the beginning, my uh, only sports I could do was trying to get up and down the uh, stairway again to leave my house, my flat, because I'm living in the first floor. So mm -hmm. this is the sports that I got. And um, after the first half year, I started to go outside and walk as far as I could. It was just a few hundred meters and get safely back. And um, after a while, yeah, I've been working with a um, physiotherapist in the beginning because, you know, my whole left side of the body didn't really uh, work. So I had uh, two times uh, physiotherapy every week. Yes. And um, she uh, was trying to teach my body to move again and my brain to be able to rewire to the muscle. This is very important to, be, to do in the beginning. Yeah. And um, I think it was like after a year that I could do um, easy sports at home. I uh, just bought some of those elastic bands, those Terra bands. Yeah. Um, 
I, yeah, I have them here too. Love them. Yeah. <laughs> Some small weights, and um, I bought a, a vibration plate. Mm -hmm. Do you this is very good for the bones. There has been a lot of research and those uh, vibrational plates have been developed to enhance your bone density. And for people that can't exercise much, that is a great option, right? The vibration plates. Perfect. We even have patients who already um, have to sit in a wheelchair because they've been ill for a very long time and they sometimes just put their feet on the vibrational plate and somehow um, lean over and um, so they can train a little bit or if they are still able to stand up it's enough if you do it for a few minutes each day oh that's great yeah and after a while i got um but this was like poof, maybe a half one and a half year um i bought a rebounder i like this very much but in the beginning i had too much vertigo i couldn't do rebounding on and my bladder was too bad so rebounding wasn't a very what, good idea what is rebounding yeah i'm, I'm agreeing but i like what well, i don't know what that is <laughs> It's a small trampoline, you oh, know, okay. yeah. yeah, and so you jump on it, and it's, yeah, I like it. Sounds it. fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this is my, this is my, uh, um, my most liked fun sport that I do like two or three times a week yes. um, in the morning as I get up, or I do my lightweight training. Um, I've been to a fitness center um, sometimes, but, you know, it's, I don't like it very much, mm -hmm. so it's, as soon as the weather is good enough, I go outside. I go for fast walks. I can't do jogging anymore because I'll stumble upon my own feet. But I'll be able to do a strict walking. Right. And I do this um, if the weather is fine yeah. two or three times a week. Yeah. And I use some resistance training with the Terra Band or the, the small weight. And mm -hmm. um, vi vibrational plate is the easiest, um, but I don't like it that much. So it's my go to option if I haven't done anything. Right. So in the evening, I realize you haven't had any sports, I hop on the vibrational plate. That's yeah. a really good alternative. Well, that's great, Christina. And uh, um, I want to ask you before we finish about the nonprofit organization, because there are some studies going on now in Germany, right? Some doctors, that's amazing, because I think it will be the first studies on the Coimbra protocol published, right? That I well, the second, Dr. Coimbra did one study um, with about patients. the psoriasis. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think 2013. Yeah. And, um, but there haven't been any studies on multiple sclerosis and not with a large number of patients. And right. um, this is something that I wanted to change. And um, lucky enough, <laughs> another Coimbra protocol patient approached me in 2000, end of 2018. It was uh, her name is Britta, Britta Meyer Peveling, mm -hmm. and she's a really dear friend by now. And um, she approached me and she said, "Well, uh, how do you do all this work around the protocol? And don't you need somebody to help?" And I said, "Yeah, please, I need somebody to help. And I need more money because if we want to do really great things, we need funding, and I don't exactly. have to." Yes. And um, so we built a, a charity, a charitable organization, uh, which is, uh, yeah, in, according to German law, if you do something that is uh, charitable for a lot of people, you get tax reduction and you can uh, get funding. And um, this is what we did. We started a um, charity, charity and um, we've been active since summer 2019 and we've built up some, uh, yeah, some structure now. Yeah. And um, I've already tried to get funding for a retrospective study for three years. So even before we funded the organization, I was trying to uh, contact other charities and tell them that they really need to give money to have studies done on the Silver Protocol, but I wasn't able to do it. And um, in 2019, um, it was kind of an accident. <laughs> I contacted another charity because I was looking for a solution for patients who don't have the money to get treated. And I was looking for a char charitable organization to pay for them. Yes. And um, then we talked about, and they said, well, we have a lot more money to give. Uh, don't you have anything? I said, yes. <laughs> so You're it's, amazing, Christina. The things you have done and what you have achieved in just a few years, I, I haven't seen anybody else even get close. You are really amazing. I mean, what you have done for the protocol I mean, guys, this lady is a special lady, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't feel like it's me or mine. It's, uh, it feels more like, I don't know, it was kind of an inner calling because it made me so sad and so angry 
that there are so many patients out there who have to suffer, suffer the same that I had to go through. And I just, you know, that was, I had to do something. I, I wouldn't have been able to sleep if I haven't, didn't do anything. So, and it was, it, I'm just, uh, um, hmm, how do you say it? It's like an energy flowing through me and um, the Kumra protocol is somehow, uh, you know, sometimes I get a bit melodramatic and I say it's like there's a guardian angel watching over this whole project. We and feel so, it's like a well, well, uh, doing well chain. That's what we do. It's a, it's a group of people that just have this impulse, right? To keep spreading it, spreading and doing and working with it. It just, you get caught in it and it just has a great energy and you just yeah. want to be part yeah. of it. Yeah, and you know, there were so many coincidences um, leading to where we are now. It was like um, I, I contacted one or two people who are uh, talking about vitamin D here in Germany. It's like Professor Jörg Spitz. He's very well known in Germany. And um, he was totally, um, it was like an open door that I could just walk through. And he said, yes, this is interesting. He flew to Brazil. He got to know Cesar Coimbra. He invited us to a big vitamin D Congress, an international Congress with Dr. Michael Hollick, uh, with Dr. Carsten Karlberg, mm -hmm. uh, the lead researcher on vitamin D deficiency. Um, he invited Cesar Coimbra and me uh, to talk about the protocol. And we, it was like a tsunami that we had here in Germany in 2018 with such a lot of patients and doctors getting interested. And there was a very famous MS researcher there. It's uh, Professor Friedemann Paul from uh, the big Berlin University Charité. And um, he's one of the best known MS researchers in Europe and maybe even worldwide. And um, Jörg Spitz, told me to contact uh, Professor Paul and he invited him to the 2018 Vitamin D Congress. So uh, he and Coimbra got into contact. And uh, Professor Paul is a very, um, he's, yeah, he's just a nice guy. He's <laughs> not only a very intelligent professor, but a very nice uh, guy, a very nice human being. Yes. And he was instantly interested uh, when he saw my MRI pictures. He was critical in the beginning, yes. but after he saw my MRI pictures, and he was so excited, and he said, I've never seen a patient that ill getting that good again. And, and if I see you today, you are able to walk, you are able to um, raise your arms, um, you are able to talk with me, you shouldn't be able to do this because your brain and your spinal cord were so severely damaged. Yes. Um, after two years, you could even see that my spinal cord started to heal. And this was something that this um, researcher, Professor Powell, was so excited about that he said, well, if something can do this, we have to do a study. It's a, it's a uh, we, we have to do it for humanity. And um, yeah, so, and then there was the thing with the charity. You just it went from there. Of thin air and said, well, we just pay for it. And um, they signed the contract in November 2019. Yes. And uh, we are already deep into planning the study. We were planning to start it this summer, but yeah, now we've got the pandemic situation. So I'm, I absolutely but it's, don't It is coming. It is coming. It, it is definitely coming, and um, uh, we are planning to watch 100 patients with multiple sclerosis for three years, and we'll do in-depth analysis not only of their blood work, but of their uh, DNA. We're doing genetic testing. Uh, we're studying the microbiome because we want to know if Coimbra protocol is able to change the microbiome. And... Um, we're doing uh, yeah, state-of-the-art uh, um, screening of their brain and spinal cord and nerves. And I think this will, this will be very, very exciting. It will be a, a huge step for the protocol. It will take it to the next level. Christina, yes. I have to tell you, we have less than one minute left. Can you believe? And we haven't You're... even started. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Uh, you have so much knowledge. I would love to have you back. Maybe we can get more into questions and answers. Uh, maybe we can talk more about the studies, the research, how it's going to go. So I'd love to have you back. Thank you so much. I'm sure, I mean, everybody took away so much useful information. And we need to do another one, Christina. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I would love to get back with you.
Yes, let's do it. And uh, we're here for anything you need. Just let us know. Okay, just keep at your work. You are truly amazing. And guys, we will see you next time. Thank you, Christina. Yes, but you are the one.